from Kansas State University. This is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here. Thanks for listening in. During the first part of today's broadcast, we'll welcome in K-State's Jane Lincolnfelser. She'll cover the results of the university's 2020 Corn Hybrid Performance Test, which evaluated hybrids at 15 dry land and irrigated test locations around Kansas. Jane will go over the growing conditions this past season, how they impacted the field trials, and she will highlight location by location the top yielding hybrids, as well as how you growers can best use the performance test information in your hybrid selection for 2021 production. Also today, with his weekly commentary on life in rural Kansas, K-State's Gus Vanderhoven, along with more here on Agriculture Today. A social distancing tip. Putting distance between yourself and others is critical to slowing the spread of coronavirus. So here are ways to stay in contact without the physical contact part. Call, send a text, set up a video conference, post on social media, dedicate a song on the radio. If you have symptoms of fever, dry cough, and shortness of breath, call your health care provider before going to their office. For more info, visit coronavirus.gov. Let's all do our part because we're all hashtag alone together. Brought to you by the Ad Council. We appreciate you tuning in for this Agriculture Today at Midweek. We'll get into the details of the 2020 Corn Hybrid Performance Tests conducted by the Department of Agronomy at Kansas State University. As you corn producers well know, these trials across the state render great information for you to utilize as you settle on your hybrid selection for the next growing season. Joining us once more, the agronomist in charge of K-State's crop performance tests, Jane Lincolnfelser. Jane, always good to have you by, and at the outset, we'll point out to producers that the full story on hybrid performance is easily accessed a number of ways. That's right. The results all are available and have been for a while at agronomy, that's A-G-R-O-N-O-M-Y dot K-S-U dot E-D-U. And the print copy of the 2020 Corn Book will be published in January by High Plains Journal Magazine and will be available at the K-State Research and Extension Publications Library. And that address is ksre.ksu.edu slash bookstore and click on corn. And the print copies of the book will be available in local extension offices in January. For context, this growing season, and the producers know how it went for them individually, but how did 2020 conditions impact the performance trials? Well, 2020 was an extremely mild corn season this year. The corn season started off well with generally good conditions for planting and stand establishment. And even stands are pretty important for maximizing growth and yield potential later in the season. There were areas in southeast Kansas that had to be replanted or were drowned out in low-lying fields, but in general, corn planting occurred without the delays and hiccups that we've seen for the last few years. And during the growing season, there was a dry stretch in August that affected kernel formation and the final yields, mainly in north-central, central, and west-central Kansas. But conversely, there were cornfields in northwest and southwest Kansas that enjoyed timely rains and moderate temperatures that achieved close to the maximum yields for that area. Aside from some isolated fields of very late planted corn, the freezes this year occurred late enough in the season that the grain was not affected. And um, at the end, harvest progressed under near ideal conditions for most regions, again, without the usual delays and obstacles that we've had the last few years, and was mostly completed by mid-October which is 20% sooner than 2019 and the five-year long-term average. So generally a favorable growing season, and that extended to diseases and pests as well. And let's talk of those uh, pest problems. The diseases, if you compare this year to previous years, fairly light on that score, wasn't it? It was. Uh, The disease pressure was generally below the long-term average. This was largely driven by an atypically dry conditions in August and September. Uh, There was an active tropical storm season, which pushed southern rust into the state earlier than normal. Uh, That occurred about July 15th this year. 
in northeast and southeast Kansas, southern rust incidence was high, but the severity on the ear leaf was generally low. And this was likely due to the lack of adequate leaf surface wetness, which is necessary for the infection. There were greater losses observed in central Kansas where the moisture was present during grain fill. But again, the severity was not too terribly bad in 2020. There was gray leaf spot observed in northeast and northwest Kansas. Again, also, the levels did not reach high enough uh, due to the low moisture at critical growth stages. Where gray leaf spot was present, it mainly remained in the lower canopy. There was bacterial leaf streak was reported in western Kansas, and it is most common in no-till continuous corn that was under irrigation. Uh, Foliar symptoms can be confused with gray leaf spot, but bacterial leaf streak has been common in Kansas corn production um, since it first showed up in 2016. There were reports of stock rots, but these were also lower than in previous years. There were a few reports of diploidia and fusarium ear rot throughout the state. Diploidia ear rot can cause entire ears to appear white and moldy, and it can result in kernel shrinkage and cracking. And this was compiled by Rodrigo Onofre of KSU Plant Pathology, Um, but according to Rodrigo, a generally mild disease year this year. As for the insect side of things, once more, the pressure there seemingly was not as it has been in years past. Yes, and this is according to Jeff Whitworth of K-State Entomology. And according to Jeff, um, the cornfields had relatively reduced pest problems this year compared to other years. The first pest problems were reported from southeast Kansas, as is usually the case because of the earlier planting, and these were mostly due to black cutworms. Black cutworms overwinter in the southern U.S. or farther south and migrate into Kansas annually, usually entering the southeast part of the state first. So a few black cutworm problems were reported and did cause some replanting. Other problems this year, Japanese beetles were most prevalent in northeast Kansas. The adults feed on a wide variety of fruits and berries, etc., but may also feed on the green corn silks. The silk feeding may cause concern, but rarely results in yield reductions. However, the Japanese beetle infestation seemed to be more and more common in the northeast quadrant of the state, with smaller incidents of feeding being noted throughout the entire state. Um, But despite the favorable season, relatively mild season, the USDA reported an overall corn yield of 132 bushels per acre for the state of Kansas. Uh, This is one bushel down from the 2019 average. Um, And the final production estimate of 759 million bushels uh, was 40 million down from the 2019 average. Well, there's the backdrop on corn production conditions in Kansas. And once more, the trials around the state will reflect to some extent those conditions as we go through the numbers here. As we get into the test results, tell us about the number of tests out there and the basic setup for those, if you would, Jane. Um, Yeah, I'll report the 2020 results by location, and I'll just mention a few hybrids that performed well in a particular location, but this is by no means the total list of hybrids that did well. As I mentioned, this year was generally favorable for corn, and seasons such as this are wonderful for producers, but they're not quite so good for separating hybrids in regards to performance because most materials did pretty well uh, because the biotic stresses were not limiting factors this year. We did lose the irrigated test at Colby due to weed competition from resistant Palmer amaranth. And we also ended up changing around and and switching some locations here because of some travel restrictions earlier in the spring. But generally, a good test this year. And as always, I would emphasize that it is important to compare hybrids and make your management decisions using as many sources and years of data that are available. All right. Let's get right into the highlights here, and we'll start in the northeast part of the state with your dry land trials at three locations. Is that correct? That is. Yes, we had a severance in Donovan County. Um, severance was no-till after soybeans, and the average yield was 216 bushel. 
hybrids that did well in Severance, Midland 570 and 770 did well. Also, our midday Pioneer check did well in Severance. We also had Onega in Pottawatomie County. This was also no-till after beans. The average at Onega was 139 bushels, and Midland 660 and our late DeKalb maturity check did well. Uh, We also had Manhattan in Riley County, also no-till after beans. The average yield was 176 bushels. And hybrids that did well, Midland 570, DeKalb DKC 6088, and our late DeKalb maturity check did well in the northeast dryland region. Now, you also had irrigated trials in the northeast region, worth mentioning here, too. Yes, we had Ashland Bottoms, also in Riley County. Uh, This was conventional till after beans, and our average at Ashland was 166 bushels. Um, Hybrids that did well there, Midland 570 again, and Midland 430. We also had Scandia in Republic County. The average at Scandia was 221 bushels. We did observe some gray leaf spot and southern rust in Scandia, and those percentages are reported on our online results for Scandia. Uh, But hybrids that did well, Midland 570, DeKalb DKC 6088, and Rank RK8660 did well at Scandia. Uh, We also had Silver Lake in Shawnee County. The average at Silver Lake was 214 bushels. And hybrids that did well, Midland 669 and 801. And DeKalb DKC 6595 did well in the Northeast Irrigated Region. Well, we have plenty more results we want to touch upon here, Jane. We need to take a break. So if you'd stand by for just a few moments, we'll get right back at it. Jane Lingenfelser is with us from the Department of Agronomy at K-State as we're going over the lead hybrid performers in the 2020 K-State Corn Hybrid Performance Tests around Kansas. We'll be back to continue this in a moment on Agriculture Today. What is radon? Home exposure to radon gas is the leading cause of lung cancer death in the United States for non-smokers. In Kansas, one in four homes will test at or above the EPA action level. The Surgeon General recommends all homes be tested and fixed if necessary. Visit kansasradonprogram.org for more information. Test. Fix. Save a life. This message brought to you by the Kansas Radon Program, the Kansas Association of Broadcasters, and this station. Agriculture Today continues now on the K-State Radio Network. We're in the midst of a visit with K-State's Jane Lingenfelser. She's the agronomist in charge of the university's crop performance tests around Kansas each and every year. And we are going over in this segment once again the standout hybrids in the 2020 trials for corn conducted by the university this past growing season. And we are listing region by region those hybrids that did quite well at those locations in Kansas. And we're around, Jane, to the eastern Kansas dryland trial, actually at two locations here. What can you share with us as far as those hybrids that tended to stand out? Well, in the eastern dryland region, we had Ottawa in Franklin County. The average yield at Ottawa was 175 bushels this year, and hybrids that did well, Frontier FS106 and Golden Harvest G13N18 did well at Ottawa. Uh, We also had Cairo in Shawnee County. The average there was 210 bushels, and hybrids that did well, Midland 570 and 669, and DeKalb DKC 6088 did well at Cairo. We did not have a test in Erie this year because of travel restrictions, but we're left with Ottawa and Cairo. (laughs) Central Kansas dry land now. What, one location this time around? We do. Uh, we did a little bit of switching around. Um, so we ended up with one dry land and one irrigated locations in central Kansas. Our dry land site was in Belleville in Republic County. The average at Belleville was 194 bushels. Um, there were similar issues with gray leaf spot and southern rust. And again, those observations can be found on the online results. 
But hybrids that did well at Belleville, Midland 570, DeKalb DKC 6088, and Rank RK965 did well. And then our irrigated trial was in Abilene in Dickinson County. The average there was 202 bushels. And uh, hybrids that did well, our late Pioneer Czech did well, also rank RK965 again. And Midland 721 did well in the irrigated central location. And before we leave the eastern and central parts of the state, we uh, do need to take a look at the short season hybrid trial that you conducted in southeast Kansas. Yes, this was at Parsons in Labette County, and the average there was 119 bushels. And hybrids that did well, DeKalb DKC 6595. And our early Pioneer Check did well, and also Dynagro DG50VC30 did well in the short season uh, southeast dryland test. And interesting in southeast, 119 bushels, it was a drier year there. So It was, yes, yes. And that's down, I think, about 20 bushels from, from average, but not the disease pressure that we've seen in previous years. Then to western Kansas, where, of course, there are both dry land and irrigated trials conducted. Starting on the dry land side, where did your tests take place? We had a test at Hayes in Ellis County. Uh, The test at Hayes was no-till after wheat, and the average yield was 119 bushels. Uh, I would point out that Hayes was an excellent example of the favorable year this year. Um, I went back to 2015 um, before I could find average yields over 100 bushel, so a good year for Hayes. And hybrids that did well at Hayes, Midland 570 and 669 did well, and also Rank RK 866 did well in Hayes. We also had Colby in Thomas County. This was also no-till after wheat, and the average at Colby was 131 bushels. Hybrids that did well, one from Rob Seco, 6698. Also, Dynagro D48VC76 and DeKalb DKC6088 did well in the western dryland region. And then your western irrigated trials, two locations, you tell us. Yes, we had... Well, we started with three. Uh, We lost our trial at Colby because of weed competition, Um, but we had Leody in Wichita County. The average in Leody was 215 bushels and hybrids that did well, Dynagro D55VC80 and D54SS74 did well. Also, Heine Seeds 823 did well in Leody. Uh, We also had Garden City in Finney County. The average at Garden City was 250 bushels. And a couple hybrids that did well, Dynagro D55VC80 and D57VC17 did well in the irrigated trials. Well, quickly, in our time here, you've gone through quite a few hybrids as they've stood out at those locations. But how you'd suggest producers consider that information, for this is not an exhaustive list. There were many more hybrids that registered pretty well at various locations, right? They did. And as I said earlier, uh, this year is a little bit tricky in that um, materials tended to do fairly well and perform well. um, And so it's a little bit hard to separate out. Um, This year was relatively free of stresses for the corn crop. And consequently, we didn't see as much effect from introduced traits such as drought guard or yield guard. Again, I would encourage producers to look at a variety of sources and years of data to find the products that fit best with their conditions and their management. Uh, The list of all the hybrids and seed treatments provided by the companies, along with growing degree days, herbicide, disease, and insect-resistant traits, uh, will be included in the 2020 book. And the book will come out as an insert in High Plains Journal magazine and will be available in local extension offices in January. In the meantime, the results can also be found at agronomy, A-G-R-O-N-O-M-Y dot K-S-U dot E-D-U. Also at that website, you can find results from the 2020 wheat, soybean, grain sorghum, and sunflower results are also available on the Crop Performance website. And those soybean, sorghum, and sunflower results will be coming out at some point in book form. That's the plan at the moment? That's right. Also in January, yes. Jane, again, thanks to you and all of your team for 
conducting the trials, pulling all the information together for it's no small feat to draw the data together in a useful form for our producers. And we're looking forward to visiting about the grain sorghum numbers a little later on down the line. Many thanks to you. Well, thanks for having me. She's the agronomist in charge of K-State's crop performance tests each and every growing season, Jane Lingenfelser. And once more for you, those are some of the lead hybrid performances in the 2020 corn trials conducted by the university all throughout the state of Kansas, dry land and irrigated. She listed several ways you can access the information currently, but if you're looking for a central location, simply go to agronomy.ksu.edu. Click on the extension tab on the upper part of that page and then on the crop performance test link. To follow, you'll see the data for all the locations that Jane covered with us and for all the entries, the yield, test weight, and moisture for each. A great resource of information, producers. Take full advantage of it. While we have a moment here to let you know about another informational resource that you certainly might want to check out, corn growers... K-State Research and Extension Area Agronomist for Northwest Kansas, Lucas Haig, has posted some information on his website. It's on the growing degree unit requirements for corn, the historical probability of the crop reaching that critical black layer stage before the first freeze of the fall. This factors in planting dates ranging from mid-April to late June, as well as the hybrid maturity rating. Lucas and colleagues have actually assimilated several decades of data collected at each of some 35 or so locations in central and western Kansas. Similar information from sites in southwest Nebraska and eastern Colorado, likewise. The tables that they've put together there represent the worst-case scenarios for the probabilities of success with that corn crop. Lucas notes that their data suggests that the growing degree unit requirements for maturity are reduced by nearly seven units for every day that planting occurs after May the 1st. He recommends that you producers, as you would look over these tables, consider the probabilities for the hybrid's maturity and then the probabilities for a hybrid that's three to six days shorter to give you a realistic range of the potential outcomes of that stand. You can find this particular information at the northwest.ksu.edu website and click on the crop production tab there, northwest.ksu.edu. That would also be well worth studying over these winter months. And quickly slip in here one more thing you might want to consider. This is on the agmanager.info website. K-State's Greg Ibendahl and Dan O'Brien have just put together and released a new lease simulation tool. As the name implies, it allows you to plug in the factors affecting your leasing agreements, as a tenant or a landlord for that matter, to check out various scenarios and how they might work for you. There's in fact a series of instructional videos accompanying the tool to show you how to use it and how to interpret the results. That's a fresh new entry found on the agmanager.info website. Have a look at that if you're so inclined. We'll be back with today's agricultural news headlines for you and more after this break. You're listening to the K-State Radio Network and Agriculture Today. Make hand washing a healthy habit everywhere you go. Wash your hands with soap and water for at least 20 seconds especially after going to the bathroom, before, during, and after preparing food, and before eating. If soap and water aren't available, use a hand sanitizer that has at least 60% alcohol. Life is better with clean hands. A message from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today. From Kansas State University, Eric Atkinson here. Thanks once again for joining us. On we go now to today's agricultural news headlines, courtesy, in part, of DTN. Well, due to disruptions from the pandemic, the U.S. Department of Homeland Security and the U.S. Department of Agriculture have realigned the schedule for the National Bio and Agro Defense Facility, or NBAF, 
The revised target date for achieving what they're calling substantial completion of construction, that would be at the point at which the USDA would have full access and be responsible for operating the facility, is now October of 2021. Of course, that facility is going to be located adjacent to the Kansas State University campus. The completion was previously scheduled for December of this year. However, the revised October 21 date now includes significant additional efforts to address necessary Necessary technology upgrades, which were identified since that design was completed back in 2012, as well as allowing for installation of USDA funded equipment. Now, the disruptions of COVID provided an opportunity, they say, to realign the schedule to include these items in the new completion of Milestone, which would minimize further delays to the overall NBAF program. Together, the USDA and Department of Homeland Security continue to assess the timetable for the transition of the mission from the Plum Island Animal Disease Center. There will be a delay in that transfer to NBAF, originally scheduled for August of 2023, the mission transfer transfer is now projected for December of 2023. Payments under the Coronavirus Food Assistance Program 2, or CFAP 2, totaled $12.4 billion as of this past Sunday, September the, uh, December the 13th, that is. That includes $6 billion in acreage-based payments, $3.3 billion for livestock, $1.9 billion in sales commodities, $1.1 billion for dairy, and $45 million for eggs and broilers. The USDA says that 838,000 applications were approved, payments for nine commodities totaling $100 million or more, including corn and at 3.2 billion, cattle at 2.6 billion, sales commodities 1.9 billion, soybeans 1.2, wheat 681 and a half million, hogs and pigs 522 million, upland cotton 290 million, and alfalfa at 135 million dollars. Now payments in nine states totaling 500 million dollars or more are led by Iowa at the 1.1 billion, then California, Nebraska, Minnesota, Illinois, Texas, Kansas at 600. 137 million, South Dakota and Wisconsin. Under the CFAP 1 effort, payments totaling 10.5 billion, 652,000 applications were approved there. The U.S. Department of Justice and the North American Meat Institute have asked a federal appeals court for a full hearing on a requested injunction to halt implementation of California's Proposition 12, alleging that that law would disrupt the programs at the USDA. The U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit in San Francisco recently rejected the Institute's request for an injunction against the law that requires hog producers to abide by certain regulations in order to sell pork in California. Voters in that state passed Proposition 12 back in 2018. Agricultural groups and 20 states are challenging the law, arguing that it violates the Commerce Clause. And an amicus brief followed, uh, filed, that is, with the Ninth Circuit on behalf of the Institute. The Department of Justice makes a case for an in-bank hearing before all of the judges in that Ninth Circuit. As of January 2022, Proposition 12 would prohibit the sale of pork not produced according to California's production standards. Proposition 12 applies to any uncooked pork sold in the state, regardless of whether it was raised in California. The Department of Justice said in its brief that the law is likely to have several adverse effects on functions and programs at the USDA, such as the Emergency Food Assistance Program and the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. Agricultural groups, including the National Pork Producers Council and the American Farm Bureau Federation, were joined in the lawsuit in October by those 20 states, including Kansas, Missouri, Nebraska, Oklahoma, and Texas. And recent Federal Communications Commission action could bolster Internet connectivity and speed in rural areas with limited or no access currently to broadband infrastructure. The FCC amended its rules regarding TV white spaces in late October to increase the number of maximum permissible power and antenna height of equipment so that Wi-Fi signals embedded in unused over-the-air TV channels called TV white spaces could be transmitted farther. 
Microsoft developed the technology, and the chief scientist of Microsoft Azure Global, Ranveer Chadra, conveyed the importance of the initiative and the advances in agriculture during the DTN Ag Summit last week. He said that the FCC's decision is a significant step toward allowing more producers to acquire high-speed Internet access. More than 121 million people in America, nearly 17 million of whom live in rural communities, do not have broadband access, according to a 2019 FCC report. For millions of others, satellite or other forms of Internet access is unreliable or slow. If farms have broadband, Chadra said, many only get 1 to 3 megabit per second connections. Embedded Wi-Fi signals in those empty over-the-air TV channels can connect at higher speeds, according to Chandra. The FCC ruling would bolster that effort. The Kansas Department of Agriculture will host a series of informational webinars in early January targeted at both producers and consumers. And Scarlett Hagens tells us that the focus will be on direct-to-consumer meat sales and purchasing. A five-part webinar series will be held daily January 4th through the 8th from noon to 1 p.m. and will feature meat marketing and regulatory experts. These sessions are designed for those who wish to sell direct to consumer and want to learn more about developing that form of business model. Throughout the webinar series, participants will learn the basics of starting a farm-to-fork business, including discussions about naming their business, product selection, pricing, social media marketing, regulatory considerations, and more. Business owners that have been successful with the direct-to-consumer model also will be on hand to offer advice. In addition, the Kansas Department of Agriculture will host a one-part webinar for consumers to address their questions about direct purchases of meat products. It will be held January 6th from 7 p.m. to 8 p.m. Participants will learn about basic meat science and meat processing and will receive recipes and resources for consumers to utilize cuts of beef. One of the guest speakers will be a representative from the Kansas Beef Council. Registration is now open for both the webinar series and the consumer-focused webinar. There is no cost to participate in either, but registration is required. To register or for more information, including agendas for each webinar, go to agriculture.ks.gov backslash business development. I'm Scarlett Hagens. And this is Agriculture Today. When you are in need of timely, reliable, and trusted information, K-State Research and Extension is here. Whether it's organizing people, information, or resources, they have the necessary tools. Community comes first for K-State Research and Extension. For more information and to connect with your county's extension agents, visit www.ksre.k-state.edu. This is Agriculture Today. Stop, look, and listen. The photos showed an early snowfall. Perfect. To cut your tree. That's Gus Vanderhoven of Kansas State University with comment on life in rural Kansas. Next week will be Christmas. It's time to go and cut a tree and haul the box with tinsels upstairs to decorate. Friends and family have already sent photos of their Christmas activity, which makes me think we're behind. But it has never been a tradition to set a tree up early. Friends in Maine sent pictures of getting their tree in a field where they could select a tree, cut it themselves, and carry it home. The photo showed an early snowfall, perfect to cut your tree. They selected a gorgeous tree, beautiful all around. A real Christmas tree with the fur scent. Cut and trimmed, he carried it above his head, holding it and stomping back home through the first snow. I asked him, any snow fell down your neck when hoisting it? I could see him grinning, if it did. <laughs> Cold. I asked because the standing trees all had a touch of snow, making the field with the trees look very special, a Christmas scene. I have several locations on the farm to look for just the right tree. It will be a cedar, which I will trim up into a typical Christmas tree shape with a clear leader. 
that leader will carry the top, the shiny ball with steeple. That will be the very first decoration. Next will come the lights, spaced evenly throughout the tree. There will be just enough to light up the tree and ornaments. It will be so that when you close your eyes, nearly close them and squint, you will see the individual starry lights. Very special. The tree, being a cedar, will only be green if I have been able to cut it from a sheltered place where the drying wind could not get at it. I'll soak it overnight, and inside it will stand in a shallow bucket of water, secured on a standard cross. I made the wooden cross years ago on a platform for the bucket. Then the four wires from each corner hold the tree up straight. I'll walk around it to see if the tree stands straight. While doing that, I will remember all the old stories and legends of finding the perfect Christmas tree. The story of the queen who was driven in her sled pulled by horses through the woods. As the sleigh passes, all evergreens stand up straight and show off their perfect form, thinking and wishing, Take me, take me. I am the perfect tree to stand in your palace on Christmas Day. But the sleigh keeps moving through the silent, white forest. Then the queen tells her driver to stop. Her eye has fallen on a twisted mouth, less than perfect tree. It tries to hide and bend close to the ground. Snow slides off its branches. The queen looks again, then tells her attendants, That bent tree will be our Christmas tree. It's perfect. The tree is cut down and loaded behind the sleigh. All straight and deep green trees look on in envy as the crooked tree rides by on the sleigh on the way home through the silent forest. At the palace, the tree is carefully taken down and prepared for the palace hall to stand in all its glory. Once taken from the sled and carried inside, the tree does all it can to be what it should be. The branches stretch out and the top reaches up. It becomes a beautiful tree, even with a few gaps on the one side. I will think of that story as I slowly decorate our tree. After the lights are strung out, I will select the ornaments. I will hold them in my hand. And remember... And no, I won't be in a hurry. Anneke may be busy in the kitchen. Maybe there will be Christmas music through the house. Maybe I'll hum along, remembering the old and traditional songs. At 88, my memory now goes back a long time to several places, celebrating Christmas in Australia, where it is now summer, where I went to the citrus orchard to pick oranges to hang on the tips of the evergreen tree, to force the branches down. It's amazing where your mind can take you while decorating a tree. I remember going Christmas shopping with my younger sister, Margaret. We were children in the Netherlands. My sister was so slow. I was annoyed. She did not keep up. She cried and made it worse. Margaret has been gone a long time. Since she fell to her death in the Girl Scout camp, the year she came to visit us in Mount Airy, North Carolina. How long have we been in Kansas? You think as you pick out the ornaments and decorate the tree. There are memories in life which go by in a flash. Others remain. It's all behind you. You cannot change that moment, whatever happened. Certain decorations get a special place, like the ornaments made of straw, they came from Norway many years ago when Tom, my brother, was still alive. He, too, is gone, just like Annika's brothers and sister-in-law. A friend who lost his daughter way too young said, and I can still hear him, it's not fair, it's not fair. I could not help him much. He was intensely sad. It's life. The thought came to me that to have lived and missed the people is a gift. Christmas is a gift. Celebrate it. Light up the tree and candles and be quiet. I know 
I will be walking outside on Christmas Eve. Then on Christmas Day, I will be happy. Merry Christmas to all. Gus Vanderhoven of Kansas State University with his weekly commentary on life in rural Kansas. And as we go today, remember to subscribe to the podcast version of this broadcast at agtoday.net. Have each day's program automatically downloaded to your mobile device, or you can listen directly from that site as well, agtoday.net. Meantime, we'll be right back here tomorrow and hope you will as well. Thanks for listening in. Eric Atkinson here. This has been Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network.